Hi everyone, we're good to go and get started now. I just want to do a quick check again that everybody can hear me. If you can put it into the attendee chat, um, just let me know that you, that you can hear us okay and then we'll, we'll get going. Okay, we'll get going. So some of you may or may not know me. I'm Moya Murphy and I work for MarTech Life Care and I'm an AED expert. And we've got an expert guest today, Danielle Alderson, who is public health nutritionist. So she's going to just talk us through some life-saving nutrition with a live Q&A at the end. So I'm just going to hand over to Danielle now. Hi everyone, I'm just going to take you through a quick agenda of what we're going to cover today. Um, there's a space at the end, as Moya said, for question and answer. So if there's anything that you do want to ask that we've not covered or you'd like a little bit more detail on, type your questions in and we can answer those at the end for you. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the importance of a healthy lifestyle. Um, we're going to look at the seven lifestyle factors for optimal health. We're going to talk a little bit about the Eat Well Guide. We're then going to move on to a healthy heart in preventing sudden cardiac arrest and then just give you a quick summary of important messages. So we won't keep you too long, um, but we'll give you all that information. And then, like we say, there's the space for the question and answer on the end there. OK, so first of all, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a public health nutritionist and I work as a health and wellbeing coach on the NHS Diabetes Prevention Programme. So I'm primarily focused around diabetes, but I've got a lot of experience in other areas, as you can see there. Um, I'm registered with the Association for Nutrition, so that makes sure that I keep up to date with all the current research and make sure that my practice is safe and information is correct. I was previously a nutritionist in the convenience food development, working on making ready meals healthier, um, working towards sugar and salt targets and fat targets. And prior to that, working as a healthy lifestyle coach with children and families. So real big array of things there, um, covering lots of different areas. So feel free to ask me questions on all of those as well, if anything's relevant to what you're interested in. Qualification wise, um, I'm qualified in public health nutrition. Um, prior to that, I covered a nutrition, biology and chemistry access course to give me the tools that I needed to complete the degree. Um, I've more recently com completed the Expert Health Diabetes Prevention Programme, and that's what I'm practising in at the moment. OK, so first of all, we're going to talk about the importance of a healthy lifestyle. Um, this one really just kicks off a little bit about everything that I'm going to tell you. Good nutrition is an important part of leading a healthy lifestyle. So the diagram that you can see there is giving you a perspective of where a healthy lifestyle comes into keeping yourself well. Um, heart disease and cancer are often associated with poor nutrition and a bad lifestyle. So keeping yourself active and keeping your diet healthy, making sure that you're a healthy weight can massively reduce your risk of chronic diseases and just promote your health overall. So if you look at the diagram that's on there, it might look a little bit strange at first, um, basically, the bigger that the coloured circle is on there, um, the more deaths that were associated with that problem. So you can see there that the highest one is high blood pressure. Moving on is the next highest to smoking, high cholesterol, obesity. And then we move down to the bottom, low fruit and vegetable intake, physical inactivity and then alcohol. So past that point, everything is associated with things other than lifestyle. But up to that point, the majority of the things that are on there, which take up the most part of those reasons that have led to death, um, are to do with lifestyle. So it's really important that we kind of cover at least a few of those things in giving you the tools that you need to make sure that you've got the information for the healthy lifestyle. This diagram specifically relates to um, a study that was completed in 2015 so it's quite recent in terms of what's current information as well. Okay so moving on to the things that we're going to cover in more detail. Seven lifestyle factors for optimal health. This is the background of what I'm going to take you into in more detail. So first of all up there we've got eating a healthy diet, we've then got undertaking physical activity, we've then got achieving or maintaining a healthy weight, drinking alcohol in moderation, remembering to take prescribed medication, 
stopping or reducing smoking and learning to manage stress and sleep well. So they're the things that I'm going to dig into a little bit more detail um, and feel free if I'm not giving you enough detail to type your questions and we can answer those just at the end. So first of all, talking about eating a healthy diet. So the million dollar question that everyone wants to know is what is a healthy diet? Um, the diet industry is massive. You'll see every January that a new DVDs come out for fitness, a new diets come out and a new juicing diet, a new shake diet. And really we want to know what is the right thing to do. There's a lot of controversy around different diets and not much information backing up the science behind things. So it is difficult to decide what you want to do diet wise. And sometimes people find they can follow a diet and what happens is they can follow it for maybe six, eight weeks. And then all of a sudden they have to go back to the normal way of eating. And that tends to be the cycle that people go through. So what you're looking at in front of you is the Eat Well Guide. This is the NHS recommendation of what our diet should look like as a population. Um, there are some limitations with the Eat Well Guide that I'm going to go through with you afterwards, but I'm just going to run through exactly what the Eat Well Guide means. Now, if you've not seen this before, it can look a little bit overwhelming. But I'm guessing a lot of you may have seen this. It's plastered on the walls in doctor's surgeries and there's a lot of leaflets with this information. So first of all, if you look over on the yellow side, on the right hand side, that section represents your carbohydrates. So it's a little bit small, so I'm just going to read that out for you, um, that we should be choosing whole grain or higher fibre versions of carbohydrates. That's basically the ones that have the least modifying to them, so they're least processed. Um, the whole grain versions, so things like whole grain seeded bread, um, lower GI, so that's the glycemic index that you might have heard of. That basically means how quick or slow that lasts in your body as energy. So the lower glycemic index potatoes, things like sweet potatoes and cereals. Really, we want to be aiming towards um, whole grain cereals. So things like porridge um, and the unprocessed types of oat cereals. Now, the limitations with that section on there um, are that it is listing things like wheat bix and cornflakes, which I'm not saying don't eat those foods, but they're not the kind of whole grain, high fiber versions that we want to be going for. They are quite processed. And as a first choice, we wouldn't be recommending them. So there are a few things on here that are likely to be updated. Say probably you'll see within the next five years. Okay, moving down onto the blue section, that's for your oils and spreads. So in terms of oil, um, a cold pressed, Vegetable oil is something that we would be frying with and using an extra virgin olive oil if we're using for dressings and baking vegetables. The reason why we say cold pressed is because when we heat an oil to extract the oil from it, a lot of the processed vegetable oils use this method and it actually destroys the structure of the oil itself. So it can give quite a lot of harmful chemicals and um, things like aldehydes for anyone who's got that extra knowledge are the things that come out of there and they have been associated with heart disease and cancer. So we're looking for cold pressed vegetable oils. If anyone's confused, usually the one that's most expensive is the one that's the cold pressed, unfortunately. So that's an easy way of looking at it. OK, moving down onto your dairy. Again, a limitation of the dairy section on here is that it says choose lower fat and lower sugar options. If you aim towards the most natural version of the dairy product, so the thing that has the least processing, so the full fat natural yogurts, um, the spreads that are the butter spreads, so they would be solid at room temperature. The things that have least processing tend to be the ones that behave the best in your body. So in terms of choosing a lower fat spread, that's something that is your choice. But the ones that behave the best in your body are the ones that have had the least processing. So the most natural version and then you've not had something added to it. The problem with choosing a lower fat or a lower sugar option is that when they take one thing out, they put something else into it to make up for the taste or the texture. So if we just aim towards the most natural version, we can't go far wrong with that in terms of choice. OK, moving down onto the sorry about that, protein section, um, the pink one down there. So you want to be aiming for two to three portions of your protein. Um, a day and a protein portion would be about the size of your palm. So you're looking at things like lean meats and fish and um, beans and pulses. And you, with 
in terms of fish, you want in at least one of those to be oily awake. So that's your things like your salmon and your mackerel. That makes sure that your body gets all of the omega-3s and the omega-6s that it needs. Um, we have to eat the omega-3s and 6s from the diet because we can't get them anywhere else. The body doesn't make them itself. The omega-3s and 6s have been positively associated with heart health um, and reduced inflammation in the past 20 years of study. So there is a lot of evidence to show that omega-3s especially um, are very positive in terms of heart health. So they're the ones that you want to be aiming for. If we move around now to the green section, which takes up a big section of this plate, that's your fruit and vegetable intake. Um, fruit and vegetable wise, anything counts. So whether it is frozen, tinned, fresh, um, it all counts towards your five a day. Um, the recommendations now are actually that we have between five and nine portions of fruit and vegetables a day. So making sure that you get some green leafy vegetables in there have also been associated with heart health and giving you enough iron in your diet. So making sure you've got a good variety of those. You may want to make sure also that only two to three portions of the five a day are coming from fruit. And that's just because the sugar intake in fruit is a little bit higher than what it is in vegetables. So if you make that ratio of fruit slightly lower, you can make sure that you're not going over your sugar and carbohydrate from sugar amounts. Okay, I'm gonna move on now. Um, I hope that was helpful for you. If there is any questions around the Eat Well Guide, then feel free to type them in because I know that is quite a lot of information in one slide. Okay, so moving on next to physical activity, which is as important as diet. The thing with nutrition and a healthy lifestyle is that no thing on its own is going to help you as its own single thing. You need to do a combination of all of the things. Um, unfortunately, even if you have a diet that is absolutely tip top, you've got no problems and it's following all of the guidelines. If you're not active um, and you're not getting enough sleep, things like that can contribute to disease, unfortunately. Um, so you need to make sure that you're getting a mixture of all of the things that can keep you healthy. So physical activity. Um, the first thing that we've got on there is how much physical activity do adults aged 19 to 64 years old need? So you've probably heard um, 10,000 steps is kind of what we're aiming for. 10,000 steps um, recently has been um, shown that it's not got much evidence behind it. So they're kind of changing the recommendations. Um, the current recommendations by the NHS are that we get 30 minutes moderate intensity exercise five times a week, which is quite nice um, and refreshing for anyone who has been counting the steps and tracking how many steps they're doing, because 10,000 steps can be quite difficult to achieve. The 30 minutes five times a week has got a lot of research behind it in terms of promoting heart health, um, lower incidence of disease and um, making sure that blood pressure is stable as well. So there is a lot more evidence behind that than what was behind the 10,000 steps. You're probably thinking, well, what's a moderate intensity activity? So a moderate intensity, the easiest way to describe it um, would be that you you kind of warm, you're getting a gentle sweat, you might be a little bit out of breath. However, you would still be able to hold a conversation with someone that was next to you. So you're not so out of breath that you're kind of exhausting your body, but you are getting that work there. You're getting the blood pumping and you're getting your heart beat and you're going to be a little bit out of breath. The moderate intensity, again, has a lot of evidence behind it. If you can get to that moderate intensity level, you're going to give yourself the positive effects on your blood pressure and your heart health. In terms of um, what activities strengthen your muscles, any kind of body weight exercises, so things that just use your own body, you don't have to particularly use any equipment, things like press ups, sit ups, um, squats, lunges, anything that you can make a resistance with your own body. Um, you can do exercise classes, so things like resistance bands, or you could also use weights, but it is not necessary to use any equipment. You can just use your body weight exercises. In terms of how much should be aerobic and how much should be muscle strengthening, if you aim for three of the 30 minute sessions to be aerobic, so the ones that get your heart beating, things like walking, um, an exercise class, maybe a different sport, and then the other two of the 30 minute sessions to be a strength training exercise. 
So other things that come under the strength training exercises are things like yoga and Pilates. So it doesn't have to be something where you go and you're lifting 100 kilogram weights in the gym. It's really not that difficult. It is something that we can all carry out in our own home. And the aerobic exercise can be something as simple as a fast walk. And um, so you don't have to pay any money to be going for um, expensive memberships. It's all something that's really achievable, which is refreshing to know. Some things cross over between the two. So sometimes things don't always fall into either um, an aerobic activity or a resistance. There would be both. So things like swimming, cycling, um, a rowing machine, some kinds of sports. So ones where you might be running, but also throwing. So things like rugby um, and those kind of exercises where you would be crossing over a little bit of both. Um, obviously, the higher intensity activity, the less of it you have to do. So it's just about exercising a little bit of common sense in the things that you choose there. OK, moving on to achieving and maintaining a healthy weight, something that a lot of people have struggled with probably all of their lives. Um, and again, want to know what is the magic cure? Unfortunately, there is no magic cure. Like I say, all of the things that we're talking about pulled together. But the, the things that we are talking about, things like achieving, a, maintaining a healthy weight, having a good physical activity regime, keeping a healthy diet can make sure that your risk of disease is a lot lower. So one of the things that we use to look at how well controlled your weight is, is a BMI chart. Now, there are some limitations with the BMI chart that I'm going to explain to you as well. Um, but first of all, for someone that's not seen it before, I'm just going to explain what this is. So along the left hand side, you have got the height of the person. So again, you would go um, down in the height to see where their height falls. Across the top, you've got the weight. So if you pull together, so if you pick a height, say the middle and the weight from the middle and pull down to meet in the middle, that's where the BMI number is. Now, the ones that are scoring in the blue um, are underweight. In the green is a healthy range. Overweight is in the yellow obese is in the orange and then the red is extremely obese so it's giving you a good indication of where you fall in there now i said at the beginning that there are some limitations with this so the problem that sometimes we have um, as nutritionists is that we might weigh somebody um, who to the naked eye looks really healthy they don't look overweight and when you get them on the bmi chart they come up as being overweight now, that often happens in someone who has got a lot of muscle mass. So things like bodybuilders, rugby players, someone who takes a lot of exercise and their muscles are quite dense, they would weigh quite heavy. Now, if they're not very tall for their weight, that would put them in an overweight or an obese category. So the BMI chart doesn't allow for muscle mass. It's got no way of saying how much of that body is fat and how much of it is muscle, which can be quite complicating when you're trying to just chart someone on whether they're overweight or not on there. So aside from the BMI chart, we use another tool as well, which I'm going to move on to in the next slide. And that is a waist measurement. So there's been a lot of evidence to show that in women, an increased um, waist measurement of more than 80 centimetres and in men, more than 94 centimetres have been associated with things like type 2 diabetes, heart disease and some cancers. Um, I say some cancers because there's not a lot of evidence into the cancers, but it's becoming more and more predominant that obesity is being associated with some cancers. Now, the healthy range for women is below 80 centimetres and the healthy range for men is below 94 centimetres. The waist measurement is usually taken two fingers above the belly button. Um, the reason for the specific place where we do that measurement is because that's where you have a lot of your insulin receptors around your middle, around your organs. Um, your body's very clever in terms of where it stores your fat. If it was to be that you were going to be starving, it would make sure that your organs were fed first. And so the insulin receptors work really hard in storing you a nice layer of fat around your middle. Now that is normal. Everybody needs that layer of fat around the middle. However, when it becomes too high, that's when the problems tend to start. Um, the increased waist measurement is associated with fatty liver. It's associated with increased risk of heart disease and diabetes. Um, and that's when things tend to become a little bit out of control. And we want to bring that back to where it needs to be. 
Um, so when we give out a waste measurement, it's usually alongside a BMI measurement. So you've got a good idea then of one, whether that person is overweight. And if it is saying that they're overweight, where are they storing that fat in terms of their risk of developing certain diseases? So we try to use those two things together. There are other ways in which we can look at people's health, obviously. In terms of weight, we can do body mass um, and body fat measurements, but these are the ones that would be simple to do in any clinic without any particular um, fancy equipment. So that's why I'm telling you about those ones. Okay, moving on from weight, um, drinking alcohol in moderation. So just recently, the alcohol recommendations have changed and that's what I'm showing you on there. So it used to be different for men and for women, but at the moment, we're just working towards 14 units a week. So you're probably thinking, what does an alcohol unit look like? So these measurements that are on there are showing you what an alcohol unit looks like. So you've got a standard measure of whiskey, a small glass of wine and um, you've got the beer on there and you've got an alka pop so that would the amount that's shown on those images is the one unit so one drink doesn't always equal one unit unfortunately there's a lot of evidence to show that drinking the alcohol in the limits that is given there 14 units a week is actually quite healthy for you. Um, there's been a lot of research and evidence come out recently that's showing that drinking the lower carbohydrate um, alcohol, so things like red and white wine um, and spirits, as opposed to beer, lager and cider, can actually have really good health promoting properties. So there's antioxidants in things like your red wines, especially, um, that are really good towards leading a healthy lifestyle. So it's not actually about not having any alcohol at all. It can just be about making the right choices in terms of alcohol. If anyone's got any questions on the lower carbohydrate amounts um, in alcohol, then please feel free to ask them in the questions and we can answer those at the end. Okay. So moving on to prescribed medication, I'm just going to brush over this one because I'm obviously not a doctor. I am a nutritionist. However, I deal with a lot of patients who um, have been prescribed a medication and for whatever reason, they don't take that medication. Um, there is some information here shown from a study in 2008 um, that is showing the reasons why people don't take their medication. So you can see those on there. Um, I'm not going to read them out, but the the biggest one that's on there is that the patient feels that it's not needed. So often we will see people who might say, well, I take this medication, but I'm going to stop taking it because I don't think I need it. That's not a diagnosis. It's not a reason to stop taking that medication. So we need to encourage that people continue to take the medications, whatever that is for, and that they get regular medication reviews. When people are losing weight and when they're changing the diet and their exercise regimes, the medication is often affected by that um, and that's when we would send people back to the doctors make sure that say for a blood pressure medication if they lose weight it would dr dramatically reduce the dose so we're making sure that they are keeping up with a regular medication review and that is the key point there rather than trying to diagnose trying to recommend what things we think they should take and um, sending them back to the gp and getting the expert advice on the medication and to keep taking it until they're told otherwise. Okay, moving on to smoking. Um, some information around smoking and hormone balance. Smoking can um, increase the hormone in your body, cortisol, which you might have heard of. It is a stress hormone that's usually associated with stress. Um, what that is, is in smokers, when you are smoking a cigarette or an e-cigarette, it heightens your cortisol levels. Now, when the cortisol level is heightened, it promotes your liver to release glucose into your body. What glucose is, is basically just your body's form of energy. Um, unfortunately, when glucose is released into the body, it then gives you an insulin reaction in your body, which promotes weight gain. Insulin is a weight gain promoting hormone. It's a weight storing hormone. Um, so unfortunately, that whole cycle um, in smoking can make all your efforts towards leading a healthy lifestyle, having enough exercise, getting your diet correct, um, thrown out the window because you are still smoking. Um, 
it reduces your appetite when you are smoking so that can sometimes be seen as a positive people think that if they stop smoking they're going to eat more they're going to put on weight um, unfortunately the smoking and the chemicals that are in there messes with your hormones and your hunger cues um, it also messes with your fullness cues. So instead of making you eat less, it, what actually does is make you make unhealthier choices um, and your body's not necessarily gaining the correct nutrients that it needs because you are kind of eating on the go, um, grab and go situation and you're not making the right choices there, which can be detrimental to all of your other health efforts. Um, Smoking in terms of cortisol, I'm going to move on to that a little bit just in the next slide in terms of the stress hormones, because you will have heard of cortisol being the stress hormone. Um, smoking and heart health, obviously, we're all aware that heart health is something that smoking affects. Um, and there is actually evidence that shows that smoking or a cigarette or an e-cigarette gives you an increased risk of a heart attack by five times. So it's about being mindful that that risk is there and knowing that smoking's not exactly something that's good for you. We all know that anyway with all the adverts that are out there. However, having that additional knowledge about the hormone balance and the appetite regulation, as well as the heart health, is something that we need to be trying to um, iron out. Okay, and just lastly from myself, before I move on to Moya, um, stress and depression and anxiety and also sleep quality. So I talked a little bit about cortisol um, there, which is released when we are smoking. Um, cortisol is associated with being a stress hormone. So when we are stressed, and we're not talking um, being stressed, maybe getting stuck in traffic on the way to work, we're talking long-term um, chronic stress. We and naturally releasing cortisol and adrenaline in the body. As I just said on the previous slide, that then promotes a glucose reaction. The glucose reaction promotes the insulin reaction, which is the fat storing hormone. So by being constantly stressed, we tend to notice that people who have high pressure jobs, jobs might have um, the round, what we like to call the capital D tummy. And that is because the insulin there is building up and it makes the stomach rounder. Um, unfortunately, this is something that can't always be broken down with diet and exercise. It is a question of managing your stress, managing your relaxation techniques and really reducing those cortisol and adrenaline hormones in the body. Um, poor sleep quality affects our appetite. So when we are tired, as you all probably know, we tend to crave for things like sugary and carbohydrate rich foods. Unfortunately, again, with that glucose reaction, if we eat something that is sugary or carbohydrate um, full, then we have increased insulin reactions in the body and then we have promoted weight gain. So the insulin is the fat storing hormone that promotes the weight gain. So by being tired, we're then kickstarting that cycle and we're actually going against the things that we're trying to achieve in terms of diet and exercise just because we're tired. So making sure that we're not stressed so we can keep those cortisol and adrenaline hormones down and also making sure that we have got um, at least seven to eight hours sleep a night, which seems like quite a lot. But actually, if you start to do that, you will feel a lot better. Um, that can make sure that your appetite regulations um, are kind of at a level where you're not going to be having those sugar and carbohydrate cravings. Any questions on any of that in further detail, please, please feel free to write them in a at the end. Okay, so moving on to the importance of nutrition for a healthy heart. So Danielle's gone through um, nutrition with you. So it's just important now to bring that back to a healthy heart. So as some of you might know, MarTech really work to make life better. Um, we just also want to make you aware that sudden cardiac arrest is the world's biggest killer. Now, one of the common causes for that is heart disease. So what is a cardiac arrest? What are we talking about? So it's essentially an abnormal heartbeat. Now it causes the heart's normal rhythm to suddenly become chaotic. This just means that the heart can no longer pump oxygenated blood effectively around the body, which is gonna to lead to the victim collapsing, becoming unresponsive, and they'll not be breathing normally. Now the only known treatment for this is defibrillation. Now you, some of you might have heard or seen of an automated external defibrillator. Now what that does is it's used to administer an electric shock to a person who is having a cardiac arrest and it just allows the heart to reset to a normal rhythm. 
So just to give you some statistics and facts surrounding cardiac arrest. So it's currently killing about 140,000 adults in the UK each year. Um, and it's not just affecting those people who are unfit, unhealthy or unwell. It's actually killing about 12 to 15 young people each week in the UK alone. So you've probably seen more recently, like in the media reporting, whereby I think about 270 school children have sudden cardiac arrest each year um, and that's also some of the sports stars as well so you might see rugby players football players and those people are young fit and well and in their prime and very well taken care of so it's just important to be mindful that if it can happen to anyone like that it can happen to all of us now just looking at the four key links to maximize survival so how would you respond if you encountered a sudden cardiac arrest so there's four th key things that you need to do the first thing is early access, so getting help. Start shouting for help with people around you, but also ringing 999 to make sure that the paramedics are on the way. You want to straight away start early CPR, and that's getting your hands on the patient's chest and giving the chest compressions. And what that does is it buys you time until either the paramedics are on site or until somebody has located the local AED. Once you have the defibrillator there, you want to get the unit turned on and get the pads on the chest and you want to deliver that shock to the patient to restart the heart. And then the final key point is to get them early access to advanced care. But it is really, really important, guys, just to remember that the only proven treatment for a cardiac arrest is defibrillation. So if we're relying on a local ambulance service, by the time maybe that you make the first call, you're probably going to be on the phone for about a minute. I would say it's likely that it's the first responder that's on site and that could take anywhere up to eight minutes. By the time that they might get from the front door through security and reception and to the patient, that could be another minute. And the time to the first shock in that case would be 10 minutes with the rate of survival at less than 10%. Now, if we jump down to the bottom to public access defibrillation or workplace defibrillation, you're going to know pretty quickly if somebody's collapsed beside you. Hopefully, you're going to raise the alarm. Um, somebody can go and get the defibrillator. So really, time to first shock would be three minutes if you've got an on-site AED. And in that instance, your rate of survival is going to increase upwards of 70%. It's really important to bear in mind that the survival rates um, increase 10% per minute. So if you don't have a defib on site, the clock is ticking. So it's really important to act fast to give the patient the best treatment. So just a couple of questions for you really. How far is the hospital or ambulance station from your home, maybe from your kids' school or from your workplace? Just be mindful to be looking out for those AEDs. Where are they located and how would you get access to them? Where is your nearest defibrillator in that case? Is it the local ambulance service? Is it outside the local pub? Um, or is there one maybe at the local council? And also, would you know how to use a defibrillator? So it's important just to bring it back to the point that we do have the most easiest to use defibrillators and we can help you become rescue ready. We've got loads of tools readily available, including like risk assessments that can help you look at your current um, workforce, the layout of your workplace, school or your home as well, just to make sure that you can give the best treatment if somebody was to have a cardiac arrest. I'm just going to hand back over to Danielle now just to do a bit of a brief summary of the important messages and then we'll finish up finally with the question and answers. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so just to go through really um, the few things that I've told you there. So there's the importance of a healthy lifestyle as a whole. Um, the seven lifestyle factors for optimal health. So making sure that we are covering all of those seven lifestyle factors rather than just focusing on one. No one of them is more important than the other. It's important to look at all of them as a whole to receive um, a healthy lifestyle. The Eat Well Guide is focusing around your diet. Um, the exercise recommendations is making sure that you are physically active. So just to remind you, that was 30 minutes five times a week of moderate intensity activity. Um, this strengthens your heart muscle, lowers your blood pressure, increases your fitness and it decreases your incidence of disease. Um, the BMI and the waist measurements, so 
making sure that you're not just taking one of those measurements by itself and looking at the whole picture can just really give you an overall view of where you're at health wise rather than focusing on one thing. With the BMI, like I say, sometimes people are coming up overweight um, when they can have quite a high muscle mass and it's unfair in that situation. So it's important to take in other factors into account. Um, alcohol units. So again, there are some health benefits of drinking alcohol, especially things like red wine. Um, so making sure that we're sticking to those 14 units a week and knowing what the units are. Um, moving on to prescribed medication, so making sure that we're not kind of advising patients on um, what they should be taking or shouldn't be taking and directing them back to the experts at the GP, making sure they're having those regular reviews. Um, now, in terms of smoking, the cortisol hormone is the one that's heightened when we're smoking, and this is the one that is also associated with a stress hormone. So cortisol and adrenaline are the ones that we want to be keeping to a minimum. So making sure that we are reducing or stopping smoking ideally um, and keeping stress to a minimum and practicing things like relaxation and mindfulness techniques can help to manage stress because we're not always in control of the stress that we're under, unfortunately. But by controlling how we deal with it and how our body manages it can help to reduce those hormones back down. Okay, any further questions? Um, I can see that we've got a few on there already. Um, we'll be answering them now. Okay, so I've got one, just somebody has asked if you need training to use the defibrillator. Now, that's a really common question. We do get asked that all of the time. Um, you don't necessarily need training. You might have noticed that the ambulance service is heavily promoting defibrillators out in the community and in the workplaces. The way that they are designed is for the untrained user. So they are completely fail safe. Now, our defibrillators in particular have FDA approval. So they've gone through quite rigorous testing and it would never be the case that they could deliver a shock to a patient that didn't need one. However, on the other hand, it's nice to have a little bit of familiarity around a defibrillator. At the end of the day, it is a medical piece of equipment and if we haven't seen it before or used it before, it can become quite daunting. So at MarTech, we do have a number of different training courses and if anybody has any interest in that, you can contact me outside of today and I'd be happy to help you provide some more information on that. I'm going to just hand over to Danielle. I know that she's got a couple of questions as well. Okay, so we've got some questions here on the Eat Well Guide, um, which is great. So someone is asking, um, is it different if I'm a vegetarian and I'm on my way to becoming a vegan in the future? So the thing with vegetarian and vegan diets is to still try to follow um, the Eat Well Guide as much as possible. What you will find is obviously the milk and dairy section. You would pick the dairy alternatives to make sure that you're still getting the vitamins there in terms of calcium and vitamin D. Um, you need the calcium in your body for the body to be able to um, synthesize a lot of different vitamins. So it's important to make sure that you are having an alternative um, that's vegan or vegetarian friendly rather than just cutting them out altogether. Um, the next thing, obviously, on there is the meat and fish element of it. Um, you need to be focusing your protein portions around the vegetarian and vegan options. So the things like the beans, um, legumes, the pulses, anything that you can use as a vegetarian or a vegan option. The corn options are also great um, in providing you to make sure you've got enough protein. Um, in terms of protein portions, you're looking to two to three portions a day. Again, the size of your palm. And the same with milk and dairy, two to three portions a day. Um, now, a portion of, say, a milk or a milk alternative would be 150 ml glass. Um, in terms of a cheese, it would be a small matchbox size piece of cheese. And a yogurt would be um, the kind of Activia size yogurt, so a medium sized yogurt. So you can get those portions quite easily um, using the alternatives as well, just to make sure that you've got those vitamins in there. Um, I've also had a question where we can get mindfulness information and how much is good for us to be doing in terms of mindfulness. So there's a lot of mindfulness information on the NHS website. There's also lots of apps that you can get. There's one called Headspace, which can give you a lot of practice in mindfulness. Um, and it also can kind of speak you, uh, talk you through what you need to do when you're trying to practice mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is a skill that needs to be developed. So when you first start to do this, um, in, in terms of a stress reduction strategy, you will find that your mind's wandering off into what you might be having for your tea that night. 
the practice is that you just recognize that your mind's wandering and bring it back to your current attention um, and that is what strengthens that muscle in your brain and gives you that skill to keep practicing your mindfulness so on the internet and also searching in app stores to just have a look at different ways of practicing mindfulness um, guys, we probably are just running out a bit of time now. We do have some more questions and we will send you a copy of this webinar. Um, alternatively, I've got everyone's contact details as well um, and I will provide you all with mine once we send the webinar. So if anybody has anything else that they do want to go through, please feel free to get in touch and we'd be happy to help you further and just keep an eye out for any other webinars that we are running. Hopefully that you find today's content really useful and we just want to thank you again for joining us.